The BYU football program continues to get work done in the transfer portal with the addition of Jackson Cravens to BYU's defensive line. What does it mean for BYU's fortunes in 2023 and beyond? We'll talk about that. We'll also begin our position group debriefings, looking at the quarterback position. What does BYU have in reserve, and what are they adding to that unit? we got all of that ahead on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jay Catch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show. Very proud to be part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where, of course, the motto is your team every day. And as such, we are your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Thank you once again for checking out the show. Our goal here is simply stated is to make you guys the smartest BYU fans in the room. And let's dive right in on today's show and talk about a new addition via the transfer portal for the BYU football program. That being former Tim Few star Jackson Cravens announcing he's going to spend his final season of eligibility with the BYU football program. Now, if that name sounds familiar to some of you, not surprising. As mentioned, he was a star at Tim View High School just up the street from BYU. Had family connections. I believe his mother is related to the Whittingham family or, or is a member of the Whittingham clan and that obviously uh, lent itself to his being far more interested in the University of Utah spent a short stint at Utah after committing there uh, to his uncle I believe Kyle Whittingham and then ultimately transferring to Boise State where he has spent the past four seasons suiting up for the Broncos and in four seasons he's put together a, a pretty good overall stat sheet albeit not spectacular that's the biggest thing is in four seasons 73 total tackles four and a half sacks and one pass breakup but his job uh for Boise State and just in general as a defensive tackle slash nose tackle is to occupy other guys to allow the other players on a defense to go and make plays and that's the one thing I like about this addition for BYU is they continue to get work done in the portal addressing problem areas for this football program think about it Jaron Hall with the gaping hole they add Keaton Slovis now you might wonder okay what is Keaton Slovis going to offer to BYU well only time will tell but defensive line how bad was BYU's defensive line this past year they had their moments sure they were very few and far between, and that's that's where BYU is very much focused on uh, fixing things. Jackson Cravens, if you go by the pro football focus numbers, would have been BYU's top-rated interior defensive lineman this season. He was very, very solid, if uh, if not uh, 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 spectacular is probably the wrong term, but he wasn't necessarily a star for the Broncos, but there's a reason why this guy was a starting caliber defensive lineman, and he would have been BYU's best defensive lineman in 2022. Now, I understand that's not saying much considering how bad BYU's defensive line was, but think about how, about how BYU's going about addressing their issues they have on this roster with the holes in it using the transfer portal. You add Jackson Cravens short the interior of BYU's defensive line. The other bugaboo for BYU's uh, defensive line has been their pass rush. Sure, Tyler Batty and uh, other guys like John Nelson are, are solid players, but have they really consistently been able to rush the passer? No, frankly, they have not. And that may be in large part due to the scheme and what they're being asked to do as defensive linemen. But you add Isaiah Bagna uh, from uh, Boise State in addition to Jackson Cravens, that immediately, and I mean immediately, upgrades BYU's defensive front. I consider both of them to be day one starters for BYU in 2023. I think they will be taking snaps the very first uh, game against Sam Houston State, probably as starters for BYU, and they immediately make BYU's defensive line that much better. Now, like I mentioned, the def defensive line was so far down that really there's only one way to go, and that's up. So the hope is that they can bring a lot of pressure off the edge in the case of Bagna and then obviously hold up against the run and just make life miserable for opposing offensive linemen if you're Jackson Cravens. Obviously, guys like John Nelson and Tyler Batty having some of the pressure lifted off their shoulders should uh, be able to have a little more output. I think guys like Nice Amahe, uh, 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 Caden Haas, et cetera, on the interior of B BYU's defensive line should be uh, benefited from this as well. And the other guy to keep an eye on, he's not a transfer, but a guy that's coming into the BYU football program as a gray shirt Brooks Miley. I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing him finally speaking up for the Cougars. Very highly thought of defensive lineman out of St. George and Pineview High School. In his high school days, served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that was returned 
uh, to join the BYU football program. And the expectation is he'll be fully healed from a shoulder injury that kept him out this past fall. And he'll be ready to go as a freshman for BYU in 2023. So I, th I think BYU, the overall tenor of how they're using the transfer portal, I think it's got to be fairly positive. Are they signing the quote-unquote star players? No, they're not. And I don't think any of us expected BYU to necessarily go out at the quote-unquote superstars out there. But they have gotten solid additions across the board so far in the transfer portal. Another guy to keep an eye on, and I got to give a hat tip to Robbie McCombs up there at Bankers the Foe, is that BYU is currently trying to address some of their issues with the wide receiving core. They want to add more depth to that position. They believe they have found a target in Freddie Roberson. And I, I, I think I accidentally yesterday on, on yesterday's podcast uh, said Reggie Roberson. Uh, Reggie Roberson was a guy who played for SMU and obviously spent time in the NFL. So my apologies for misidentifying Freddie, but Freddie, Reggie, close enough. But nonetheless, he's got a top four currently announced with BYU, Mississippi State, Washington State, and Fresno State as the top four schools he's looking at. But he did add an offer just yesterday from Penn State. I do wonder if that may uh, throw a wrench into his plans. But this is a guy, speaking of Roberson, similar to the other guys BYU's added in the portal, is a solid, if not uh, a great uh, type player. He has had 2,200 yards received in four seasons playing at Eastern Washington at the FCS level in the Big Sky Conference. This past year, he had 773 receiving yards and seven touchdowns. Uh, that followed up the 2021 campaign when he had 779 yards. So he's got good size to him, six foot two. He's from Seattle originally. And this seems like it'd be a pretty solid pickup for BYU. Do I think Roberson, if he joins the BYU football program, is like your Puka Nakua for next year? No, absolutely not. But he would make BYU's wide receiving core that much better and obviously give another weapon to a guy like Keaton Slovis at the quarterback position. So I think all in all, the way BYU is approaching the transfer portal is they're being judicious with who they offer in the portal because they obviously have to find the right fit. Guys who understand the culture of BYU have the academics that match up and obviously want to play high level football that you think can succeed at the power five level in the big 12. And they're addressing big holes. Now, obviously I'd like to see them maybe look at the defensive backfield in particular at safety, maybe in the transfer portal. I think a linebacker might be in order as well. And maybe even uh, some look at uh, what, going on with the offensive line. I think they've short of the other positions at running back with Aiden Ross, quarterback with Keaton Slovis. As mentioned, just barely the defensive line looks far better right now with those two transfer portal additions, but there are still holes on this roster. And if BYU can address those via the transfer portal, Go right on ahead and do it. I think it's a fantastic way to go about showing up this roster. Guys like Slovis and Cravens are only going to spend one year at BYU, but in theory, if they play as well as you expect them to play, their play could help uh, build your recruiting uh, prowess, I guess is the best term to use there, and help you go out and find better players on the recruiting trail. Now, we're going to talk about BYU's quarterback room in just a minute. We do what we call our position debriefings after each, each season here on the podcast. Go position group by position group, evaluate how each player in that room did, and obviously give some thoughts on that. We'll get to that in a moment because I think it relates to what we're talking about here. But the final thought I got for you guys is that I, a lot of you, and I, trust me, I, I got a bevy of responses via YouTube, DM on Twitter. Uh, some of you reached out via Instagram myriad of different ways you reached out when BYU was very slow out of the gate when it came to the transfer portal. I, I tried to stress, be patient. BYU is going to work through this. And right now, I think they're they're benefiting from this. Could they have gone out there and gone absolutely crazy with offers like Arizona State, who seemingly has uh, added, I think, 15 or 16, at least guys that via the transfer portal? Yeah, they probably could have attempted to do that. But what does it do? the culture of BYU because we all know any of you who are Cougar fans out there know how unique BYU is and the culture that surrounds this BYU football program. I'm not saying it's it's hokey or out of touch by any means, but it is it is definitely different than most other cultures and you have to make sure guys are going to fit in with that. I think Keaton Slovis, a guy who's from Arizona, understands what LDS culture is all about. Jackson Cravens played right up the street from BYU. This guy understands BYU to a T. Isaiah Bagnall was coached by Kelly Papinga and Kelly Papinga has his ear as his position coach at, at Boise State. Aiden Robbins was a guy who, who was recruited by BYU way back in 2018. He's talked about it on this very podcast. You want to go back to last Friday's episode, you can find his one-on-one uh, -on -one with myself. And he talked about the fact that the relationship he built with BYU back in 2018 was huge when ultimately deciding that he wanted to come to BYU and be a part of the BYU football program after spending time at Louisville and obviously most recently at UNLV. So I think the way BYU is approaching things in the transfer portal right now is the right way to do it. But I'd love to have your guys' interaction with this as well. What's, I'm going to throw my question of the day at you guys. 
What are your thoughts? Is BYU succeeding in the transfer portal to the level that you would like them to be? Or do you think there's still more to be done and they could be, have been doing more from the get-go here? I'd love to hear your guys' responses. Reach out via social media, Locked On Cougars, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. My social media feeds, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jacob C. Hatch. My DMs are open. You can just tweet back at me at Jacob C. Hatch. Email us, LockedOnBYU at gmail.com. Always appreciate hearing from you guys. All right, coming up next, we'll get to our position debriefings. The first one, uh, as we look back on the 2022 season, we're going to start it off with the most important position on the football field. That is BYU's quarterbacks. We'll get to that. In just a moment. First, though, a word on our friends over at Bet Online. They've been a fantastic partner of ours literally for years here on Locked On Cougars. And Bet Online is your number one source for all of your sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. Just saw this yesterday BYU basketball. They are 25 to 1 uh, odds in terms of winning the West Coast Conference. And Zaga, as you might imagine, is a heavy, heavy favorite. They are 1 to 12 as the favorite to win the WCC this year. Uh, St. Mary. Second place with five to one odds. USF ties BYU with that 25 to one odds. But if you want to get in on all of that, go to Bet Online. You get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to the college bowl season to both college and NBA basketball. They've got you covered top to bottom. They got it all at Bet Online. If you love sports podcasts as well, you can even find those on Bet Online as well. They are the fastest and the easiest way to get your betting information. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more now. That's Bet Online where the game starts. Thank you once again for joining us here on Locked On Cougars. I want to encourage you guys to make sure you check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. It covers the biggest stories around the sports world in 25 minutes or less, included our instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. That's Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. All right, time to begin what we call our position debriefings. For those of you who may be joining the show or joining the show in the recent past, what we do is going into each season, I do my position previews. I go position group by position group, look ahead at the coming football season. And then once the season concludes, we go back and I do what we call our position group debriefings, where we look at each one of these position groups and how they performed relative to what we expected from them going into the season. It's a fun way to, I think, uh, both look ahead to the season and then at the same time, look back and say, okay, they lived up to expectations. They did not live up to ex expectations or uh, they're kind of neutral. They about what we what we thought from them. So we'll start today talking about BYU's quarterback position. And I think all things considered, Jaron Hall did what I would have expected him to do. He ended up uh, passing for 3,171 yards on a 66% completion percentage, 31 touchdowns against just six interceptions. Marvelous numbers there. Also added uh, some ground game as well. 346 yards rushing as well as three touchdowns via the ground game. I think Jaron Hall was everything we hoped he would be. The only, I think, thing that we would have liked to have seen, and this is one of those crazy little quirks about his career when we look back on it, will be the fact that Jaron Hall never played in a bowl game for the BYU football program. Uh, both the last two bowl games, he was injured in the regular season finale, uh, one at USC in 2021, and obviously the game at Stanford to complete this most recent season, and it knocked him out of both bowl games. That's a little bit disappointing not to see him have a swan song in a BYU uniform, but I think all things considered, BYU's leader at quarterback, Aaron Hall, was all that he could have been and should have been for BYU this year. Could he have done more? Okay, that's probably asking a little bit much. Could he have gotten to a 70% completion percentage? Maybe so, but considering the, 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 the in-and-out nature of BYU's wide receiving core most of this season, I think he did exactly what I would have hoped he could have done. That touchdown-interception ratio is absolutely marvelous. He only uh, was sacked 12 times. That's less than one per game. If you look back at the 13 total games for BYU, uh, as a total, BYU gave up an average of one sack per game. There were 13 on the season. Chase Roberts, funny enough, actually has the only other sack officially on BYU's tally, but nonetheless, uh, one sack per game. This is a guy who was well-protected, and I think delivered in every facet. Now, around him, though, behind him at quarterback, that's the major concern, because I think that we knew everything we needed to know looking back at it now, the week of the Notre Dame game. Jaron Hall, as many of you recall, did not practice that entire week, and it was kept hush-hush. Oh, there's still a chance he could play, and we, we expect him to be ready to go. He did not practice the entire week, and Jacob Conover, who was BYU's number two quarterback at the time, was pressed into taking the starter reps during practice. Did that lead BYU to think that, hey, we should probably just sit Jaron Hall and get him healthy and let Conover have, have the game against Notre Dame? Nope. They shot up Jaron Hall, shot up his shoulder, made it feel as good as it possibly could be, and he went out there and played. 
on zero practice the entire week. That told me, and I, I guess it probably should have told me more then, but looking back at it, I think it tells all of us everything we needed to know about Jacob Conover's potential future as a BYU quarterback. He was never going to be the guy, and ultimately, I think he had a conversation with the coaching staff. Actually, in fact, I know he had a conversation with the coaching staff and decided, you know what? My fortunes are better uh, left elsewhere. And he is one of the many players who has returned home to the desert to play for Arizona State, announcing that he was he's going to transfer to ASU. Does he ever see the field for the Sun Devils? I don't know. But I think that week against Notre Dame told us everything we needed to know. And it also probably should have told us, man, BYU's Cupboards are extremely bare at quarterback because they won a game against SMU in that bowl game in spite of Sol J. Maiava Peters. And that's nothing against Sol. He ends up 7 of 12 for 47 yards in that game, ends up rushing for a touchdown as well. He did everything he could do, but his inability, and I mean inability, to consistently deliver the football on time accurately, especially on passes down the field, absolutely crippled BYU. And in some small way, it's a miracle that BYU won that bowl game. But they won it all the same, and Sol Malva Peters, if he never takes another snap, for the BYU football program can always point to the fact that he won a bowl game for BYU. Other quarterbacks on this roster and how they perform. Cade Fennigan was a guy that we all thought might have a chance to uh, push for that number two spot for BYU and very well may end up still being the number two next year for BYU behind what I presume will be Keaton Slovis as BYU starting quarterback. But he had injuries, injuries in training camp and also an injury late in the season when he probably could have made a push to become the guy to start for BYU in that bowl game. He had a lower leg injury, I believe, foot injury based on what I remember, and it never really uh, let him live up to what we wanted to see from him, and that is actually see him on the football field. So if Cade Fenton can heal up, who's to say that he's not going to be a factor in spring ball? But so far in his time at BYU, it has been just injury after injury in critical moments when it seems like he may get his shot to jump up the depth chart. An injury knocks him out, and that, that's disappointing. The only other quarterback on the roster is Nick Phillips, a walk-on uh, from Utah, a transfer into the program. He spent this entire season as BYU's scout team quarterback, and I don't necessarily know what the future holds for Nick, but I, I thought that BYU was going to play at least Cade Fennigan and Soljay Maiava Peters and maybe even Billups in that bowl game. They rode Maiava Peters the entire way in that game, and I think that uh, bodes uh, not that great for a guy like Nick Billups in terms of his future, in terms of actually playing games for the BYU football program. Could he make a leap at some point, maybe make a, a push for playing time? Maybe so, but he is so far buried on this depth chart that I think he understands his role is, and I think he's just along for the ride. Soljay Malva Peters said it himself after the bowl game. I know I'm coming from the back. I'm going to have to battle my way up the depth chart, but I think that he understands odds are stacked against him. Now, BYU brings in two quarterbacks so far that we know of. Uh, Keaton Slovis, the graduate transfer from both USC and Pitt, comes in expecting to have a monster season in his final uh, collegiate campaign, leading the BYU football program. Will he live up to it? Can he be the guy that has passed for nearly 10,000 career yards at the college level and go back to more of what he was in his first stanza at USC? That's what BYU's banking on. They need that from him because they want to remain competitive even if they're even as they are going in to the Big 12 Conference. They have to have him on point if they want to succeed at that level. Also, Ryder Burton comes into the football program. On signing day, Aaron Roderick was speaking to the media and said that Ryder Burton, he says, is around the BYU football facility more than most of the assistant coaches. This is a kid who is studying BYU's offense. He played in an absolutely archaic offense in high school, playing in a high formation, truly like old school pro style of, of formations at, for the Springville Red, Dev Red Devils. And he's obviously going to have to kind of revamp his game to fit into the BYU offense. Does that mean he can't do it? No, because BYU wouldn't have signed him on scholarship if they didn't think that he could be a part and push for playing time at some point during his career. Do I think that he is the future for BYU at quarterback? I don't. Uh, honestly, I don't think that he will be the guy. I'd love to be uh, wrong about that. I'd be happy to eat crow if he ends up being a multi-year starter for BYU or even just a starter, period at some point during his career for BYU. But that appears to be years down the road because I am expecting still this week for BYU to add a junior college quarterback, or at least in the near future, in Jake Retzlaff, uh, from, uh, Retzlaff? Retzlaff, uh, from Riverside Community College. I think that Keaton Slow is having the one-year of eligibility and a guy like Jake Retzlaff coming in who does have a redshirt year in addition to two extra years of eligibility. So he's got three years to play too. In theory, if it all goes according to plan, Keaton Slovis ends up as your starter for the first year in the Big 12 era. You get Jake Retzlaff up to speed in BYU's offense. He takes over in 2024 and potentially 2025 for BYU. 
at that point, your QB succession plan is either Ryder Burton is finally uh, paid off and he's bided his time. He ends up being the guy for BYU, or there's a bumper crop of quarterback talent that BYU is very, very aware of in the 2024 class. Chief among them, Isaac Wilson, the younger brother of Zach Wilson, playing at Corner Canyon High School. He's a four-star prospect, a guy that many schools love to have playing for BYU. Will he continue the Wilson family legacy at BYU? Well, if that's the case, he may come in uh, to BYU, and then by the time that Jake Retzlaff is done in 2025, in theory, then it's Isaac Wilson's time to be BYU starter moving forward. That's where the QB succession plan, if everything goes according to how I envision it going, that's the way you set it back up. It's been a very, very fun run over the past five years. Remember, Tanner Mangum handed off midseason to Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson took that ball and ran with it. Ended up having some up and down moments during his first two seasons, really, as BYU starter. Capped it with an absolutely monster season during the pandemic. And say what you will about his NFL career to this point, but Zach was absolutely marvelous in his final season in a BYU uniform. And then that ball gets passed immediately to Jaron Hall, and he barely misses a beat. It's been a phenomenal, I mean phenomenal run over the past four to five seasons for quarterbacks at BYU. And now they're using the transfer portal to set up the future. And obviously that run was going to end at some point. Whether uh, Jaron Hall came back for another season and made it uh, six straight seasons of stellar quarterback play, great. But you still have to make plans for the future. And I think the way BYU is setting things up, if it goes like I meant, mentioned, Keaton Slovis, Jake Retzlaff, and then whoever it might ends up being, Ryder Burton, Isaac Wilson, or insert other quarterback name out there. Uh, there's the... Uh, kid from Oregon that ended up leaving the Oregon game early due to uh, the insensitive remarks from the Oregon's crowd. What's his name? Uh, man, it's going to bug me. I'm going to remember that name as soon as I finish recording this podcast. But there is a bevy of different quarterbacks out there for BYU to recruit. Uh, they also have Helaman Kasuga, uh, a guy that's playing for Timpu High School as a star for them in their run to a state title this year at the 5A level in Utah. He's just a ninth grader. He's a 2026 class. Like you're looking at the next decade potentially of BYU's quarterbacks lining up. If everything goes according to plan, these guys live up to their expectations. That's the fun part as you project ahead for BYU. If it all goes according to plan, BYU could be set up for the foreseeable future in the Big 12. They obviously will need stellar quarterback play. That's one of the key uh, differentiators I feel like in the Big 12 is if you have elite quarterback play, you are going to be competitive no matter what in that league. If you have subpar or average quarterback play, well, guess what? You're a subpar or average team. Quarterbacks drive this league. Offense drives that league. And BYU needs to make sure that they nail their quarterback position for the foreseeable future. And at least right now on paper, they have done. That. All right. We'll round out today's show with some final thoughts on BYU basketball. Could the return of one of BYU's best players, maybe their best player in the early season, uh, be nigh as they begin West Coast Conference play on Thursday? We'll talk about that and a couple other notes in BYU sports here momentarily. First, though, a word on our friends over at UCCU. Now, I've talked about UCCU for the better part of two months now. What I can tell you about UCCU is they've been my bank my entire life. They're a credit union, but I've been banking with them my entire life, and they are absolutely phenomenal. They're offering you a special offer right now. It's a 15-month savings certificate with an incredibly high APY of 4.00%. Plus, you can jump up to an even higher rate of return anytime during the life of that certificate. It's a brainer my friends obviously we all know that we're currently in a period of high interest rates and inflation both of them on the rise that's why uccu is here with these savings certificates they want to help you guys use that time uh, with the 15 months to get more money back than it would be earning in your savings account your money market account etc that four point zero zero apy percent uh return is absolutely incredible and the best part is you can uh, allow you to jump up your interest rate if those rates continue to rise if inflation continues to go up interest rates continue to rise like we we're expecting them to do that's what the uh, federal reserve has said they will be doing at least through the early part of 2023 Take advantage of it now. Do uh, one of these savings certificates with UCCU and get that money to grow and grow and grow as fast as it possibly can with our friends at UCCU. It's really easy. Opening a savings certificate is super, super easy. You can go online, over the phone, or just stop by any UCCU branch to get started now. But remember, the offer is only for a limited time. And I can tell you guys, I have actually opened my own uh, savings certificate with UCCU. And the best part is, if you don't necessarily like the terms of that 15-month savings certificate, they've got a myriad of other options, term options, to help match your specific needs. So stop by, give them a call, or go online to uccu.com to get started on that savings certificate today. That's UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen. 
of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show, wherever you're checking it out from. Uh, I, I get these ratings uh, updates every so often about where we're being rated on iTunes charts and Spotify and that type of stuff. And folks, it's hilarious to me every so often to see, all right, you are number whatever in Norway. I had one uh, in Zimbabwe not too long ago. Uh, we were actually ranked in Chad, the, the country Chad at one point. So no matter where you guys are tuning in from, thank you. For your support as always and a reminder for you guys if you are interested in advertising with us here on the podcast new year coming up it's a great time to launch in and get started with the new year new podcast new show new advertisers love to have you guys on board locked on byu at gmail.com we'd love to get you in touch with our sales team over here at the locked on network all right final note before we go on today's show is the byu basketball could be getting one of their best players back, and that is Spencer Johnson, a guy that BYU really leaned on in the early part of the season. He's missed the past nine games. BYU going 7-2 and two during that time, so great run, albeit uh, with, without him in the lineup. But you can't tell me that he's not one of BYU's best players. A great dude to boot. Uh, it sounds like he could be coming back very, very soon. It sounds like he was a full participant at this yesterday i was unable to attend as i typically do had some other family obligations to attend to but there were reports out of uh, practice and the videos uh, coming out from mark pope indicate that he is close to returning and it'd be a fantastic thing to have spencer johnson to add to byu's arsenal going into west coast conference play do they need him necessarily this weekend as they face off against pacific and then obviously a game against portland Okay, Pacific, I think you can handle without him. Maybe give him an extra night or two to, to recover fully, and then you toss him out there against Portland and see how he does. But him back in the lineup would give a very steady hand to BYU. Remember, uh, this was a team that struggled mightily and has still continued to struggle at times against the press. You need heady ball players who understand what is going on, time and score, and understand what the situation is and can get themselves out of trouble. That's what Spencer Johnson is. He's been a very, very good three-point shooter early on this season. He's been a consistent scorer for the BYU basketball program. And if you can get Rudy Williams continue to do what he's doing as a sixth man for BYU and add that added offensive punch from a guy like Spencer Johnson in that starting lineup, that makes BYU all the more potent offensively. And we all know that at times this year, it's been an absolute struggle for BYU to score. So sitting at 10-5, and five, getting ready for that game against Pacific on Thursday night, some good news coming to BYU men's basketball program. Rams way. And I would love to see Spencer Johnson back out there very, very soon. If not Thursday, Hey, uh, the good news is he's going to be back sooner rather than later. The other thing about this is Trevin Nell, a guy that many of uh, you and myself have pinned uh, BYU's three point hopes in terms of improving the percentage. He is a limited participant in practice. He is not necessarily full go quite yet, but he's on his way to recovery. Does that mean he ends up playing the final month of the season? Who knows? But Trevin Nell would add another offensive punch to BYU's lineup here and hopefully would in improve their three-point shooting in particular. This is a squad. When they're shooting the three consistently, they can compete with anybody. But the sad part is that consistency, it's not been there all year long. And the nice part is you have a chance now going into West Coast Conference play to build on some of the momentum you, you garner. We talked about this yesterday. You've won five straight. Why not carry that forward? A couple of you actually messaged me uh, after yesterday's podcast saying, Jake, why can't BYU finish second in the West Coast Conference? I, I guess I, I'm I'm still thinking that consistency factor might catch up with them at some point. But St. Mary's has proven that they're not necessarily the world beaters that we thought they might be this year. So it's not out of the realm of possibility for BYU to finish second in the West Coast Conference this year. We all know that Gonzaga unless something absolutely crazy happens, Drew Timmy uh, suffers a season-ending injury along with a couple of, of, his, of his teammates. That's probably the only way that Gonzaga doesn't win the West Coast Conference. But I think BYU can be very competitive. And yeah, if they ride a hot streak here in West Coast Conference play, there's no reason to think they can't finish second. I guess I'm just not the one betting on it. I think a third or a fourth place finish uh, is more likely in my mind. But hey, I'd love to be proven long. Uh, love to be proven wrong. I love nothing more than eating crow and saying, Hey, I, I doubted you guys and you exceeded my expectations. That's what I love uh, doing. What I do here on this podcast is I, I kind of say it how I see it. And the nice part is the opportunity is there for anybody and any team out there to go out there and prove me wrong. So I am looking forward to it. And obviously Spencer Johnson's return will be a fantastic addition 
for the BYU men's basketball program. All right, that is going to do it for today's show. A big thank you once again for joining us here on the show. Tomorrow we continue with our position group debriefings. We may flip over to the defense and talk about BYU's defensive line. Who knows? Uh, but stay tuned for that. We'll continue those uh, throughout the coming days and weeks. Also, a look ahead to next week. It's New Year's, and we begin what I'm calling our look back, our retrospective on independence. We're going game by game, all 155 games of independence for BYU. We'll highlight one of them each show. Maybe we'll double up every so often as well throughout the offseason to get you ready for Big 12 play. Look back at independence, the highs, the lows, and the in-betweens. We've got all of that coming on Locked On Cougars. So thank you once again for making us your first listen of the day. Now go make your second listen. Our friends over at the Locked On Big 12 podcast. Josh Neighbors is your expert covering all things Big 12. Get that free and available wherever you get your podcast. Also, on YouTube. That'll do it for myself. Have a great rest of your day whenever you hear this. Hope you all are doing fantastic. This has been the Locked on Cougars podcast. See ya.